Hey guys, Kenna here. So today we're going to be taking a look at Darwin and natural selection. And the previous set of notes, we went ahead and took a look at the key influences, uh, the people who helped Darwin get to the point where he could make the claim of the theory of the natural selection in his book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And today we're going to actually look at the theory itself and try and better understand what it entails and what the implications are from that theory. So let's go ahead and start in with our essential questions. All right, number one, what role did the Galapagos play in Darwin's development of his theory? Now, hopefully you have learned at some point that Darwin was on this boat called the HMS Beagle and he took it around the world. And during that time, he saw things all over the planet and was surprised by just how perfectly they matched the environment that they were in. Okay. No place was this more impressive to him than on the Galapagos Islands, where he saw unique species that existed in the Galapagos that weren't on the mainland, even though it was close by, relatively speaking. So what led to that and how do we go ahead and understand the impact of his observations in terms of what we now know to be his theory of natural selection? Number two, how are natural selection and artificial selection similar and different from each other? Now we've talked a little bit about artificial selection, even if we didn't give it that name already. When we were talking about humans intervening and selecting the traits of species like dogs, horses, etc., this is artificial selection. We are picking the traits that get passed on to the next generation by picking which individuals get to breed. How did this influence Darwin coming up with his theory of natural selection? And who does the picking there? Number three, what are the three key pieces of Darwin's theory of natural selection and how do they work? So there are three key parts that we're gonna to investigate today as we start trying to understand how natural selection functions. And then number four, can you identify three lines of evidence in support of evolution? Okay, so let's take a second and transition over and take a look at Darwin's voyage really quickly to see if we can understand all the places that he's been and what role the Galapagos may have played in the development of his theory. So Darwin knew about the work of the previous people we discussed, everybody from Lamarck's theory to Hutton and Lyell, to the work of the people like uh, Thomas Malthus and Carl Linnaeus. And they influenced him as he took many of their books with him on his voyage on the HMS Beagle. So during his travels, Darwin made numerous observations and you can actually read his journals and they're quite interesting. In fact, the book Voyage on the HMS Beagle is far more interesting to read than actually on the origin of species by means of natural selection. But it wasn't as impactful. It was more of a <clears throat> journal of his naturalist observations. And there weren't any theories or predictions or scientific conjecture that were included in the actual original book. It wasn't until we get to all the evidence that he amassed over 20 years that we get to the origin of species. Now, if you take a look from his, at this map, you can see that he left from the British Isles, traveled across the Atlantic to South America, around the Cape Horn of South America, and then up to the Galapagos Islands before crossing the Pacific over to New Zealand, to Australia, to some islands across the Indian Ocean, the Cape of Good Hope in Africa, back to South America, and then back up to the British Isles again. So he did circumnavigate the planet, but it was a long voyage and he saw many things in that time. But again, the Galapagos were probably the biggest influence on his understanding of the world around him. He was intrigued by the fact that so many different plants and animals seemed perfectly suited for whatever environment they inhabited. But he was puzzled by the fact that why did certain species live one area but not in another? Even if they were very similar in terms of their rainfall and temperature range, it was often a different species in a different place equally suited to that environment, 
but it wasn't always the same species. As Darwin went on his journey, he also began to realize that both living organisms and fossils were key to understanding the natural world because you got to see what was there before, not just what was there now. And connecting the dots between these two helped to paint a picture of what had changed in that particular location over time. Some of these fossils ended up being very similar to things that were currently around, others did not. And so what happened to those species that weren't there anymore, that there was evidence that they were at one time. And so this is what Darwin was heavily thinking about. If you think about the work of Hutton and Lyell, he knows that the earth is an old place, that there have been all these changes in terms of movement of tectonic plates. You start looking at earthquakes and volcanic, volcanic activity impacting the structure of the earth. Well, probably the most influential of all of these was the Galapagos Islands. <clears throat> and these are a collection of islands off the west coast of South America. Okay. He looked at several different species and he's probably most famous for his, uh, his birds when he started looking at the finches, but the land tortoises were another big species that he investigated. They had different shell patterns depending on which island they were from. He observed that the characteristics of many of the animals, not just the tortoises and the finches, varied noticeably among the different islands of the Galapagos. Something was special about the particular species that lived on each island. So let's start by taking a look at the tortoises. If you look at these drawings of the different tortoises on the different islands, you can see that the shapes of their shells and the patterns of the carapace are slightly different. These variations are specific to each individual island, whether it's Pinta Island, Hood Island, or Isabella Island that you can see here in the drawing. Likewise, Darwin took many sketches of the finches and we saw the same sort of thing. Various different sizes, shapes, colors, especially with respect to things like beak size, depending on which particular island you were dealing with. Well, after 10 years of compiling data and ideas, it was his colleague's paper on evolution, Alfred Russell Wallace, that really pushed Darwin to complete and publish his own work. In 1859, Darwin published the results of his studies in a sensational book on the origin of species by means of natural selection. And this detailed his theory of natural selection. Like I said, you can get out, go out and buy a copy and read it. But in many respects, it's not actually exciting, that exciting a read, unless you're really interested in the scientific concepts that Darwin put forth. Um, the voyage on the HMS Beagle, in many respects, is, as a book itself, is probably more engaging. But let's take a look at what comes out of On the Origin of Species in terms of Darwin's theory of natural selection. Now, this is where it's good to kind of compare Darwin's theory that we're going to cover here to the theory of Lamarck. And remember, Lamarck's theory is well illustrated by our reading that we did last class over um, the elephant's child, looking at the theory of inheritance of acquired traits, things that were acquired during their lifetime and then passed on in pursuit of perfection. Now, with natural selection, this is not the mechanism that Darwin chooses. He starts out with this idea of natural variation. Darwin rejected the idea of species being perfect and unchanging. He believed that there was variation within species and that differences among individuals made them more or less fit in a particular environment. He suggested that this type of variation is found in all different types of organisms, plants, animals, you name it. And he used this idea in his studies of English farmers and breeders to help further his ideas on evolution. So when he started looking at cows and feedlots and dogs and horses, which had been bred in England for many years, they weren't all exactly the same. What made them better at doing their particular job. As he talked to these breeders, he was really investigating what we call artificial selection. In artificial selection, 
Nature provides the variation, but humans are the ones doing the selection of those variations that they found useful. We like this cow, it produces more milk. We like this horse, it can go ahead and run faster. We like this dog, it's a great hunter. It's good at sniffing out foxes. These types of decisions were made by humans based on variation that already existed in nature. Now, Darwin really liked the idea of naturally existing variation. And then he started applying it. Well, what if humans didn't do the choosing? How would nature decide which species survived and which ones didn't? And he came up with evolution by natural selection. And it was Darwin's greatest insight to really compare the process of nature, of nature with what he saw in artificial selection, cows, horses, dogs, etc. Now, there are three key parts that I'd like you to follow along with as we study Darwin's theory of natural selection. Number one, the struggle for existence. Number two, survival of the fittest. And number three, descent with modification. Now, let's start by looking at the struggle for existence, because in many respects, this is culled straight from the work of Malthus. When reading Malthus, Darwin realized that high birth rates and shortages in life's necessities, what we call resources, would lead to a competition. And Darwin called this competition the struggle for existence, which means that each member of a species must compete regularly to obtain food, living space, and other necessities with other members of their same species and with other species. In the struggle, better equipped predators catch more prey. Likewise, better equipped prey with camouflage, whatever, avoid being caught. So it's kind of this arms race where they're battling to survive, okay? Which leads us into the second key point of Darwin's theory. And that is probably the most famous one, which is survival of the fittest. Now, a key factor in the struggle for existence was the animal's fitness. So first of all, this is a very specific scientific definition. So make sure you understand this. This is not just fitness in the sense that, oh, you know, I work out and I, I go for a run every so often. Okay. So fitness is the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce in its specific environment. Now, I want to really go ahead and highlight this. Okay that this is not just survive, like we always think about when we think of survival of the fittest, but it's also the ability to reproduce, okay? Survival and reproduction in its particular environment. Now, what decides how well it survives and reproduction, reproduces? Darwin proposes that fitness is the result of what we call adaptations. Adaptations are inherited characteristics that increase an organism's chance for survival. They can be physical adaptations, things like shells, quills, or behavioral um, traits or adaptations like group hunting. So any specific thing that helps to give that particular organism an edge in its environment would be an adaptation favorable to fitness. And fitness, remember, is the ability of an individual to survive, yes, but also to reproduce. Because if you can survive a long time, but you never have any offspring, those traits won't be passed on to future generations and therefore die with you, okay? So fitness, and this is probably the most important piece, is both survival and reproduction, okay? So survival and reproduction. Make sure you're familiar with that. Okay. <clears throat> now, because every individual differs from every other member of its species, every individual has unique advantages and disadvantages that separate them from the other members of their species. Individuals with characteristics not well suited to the environment either die off or leave fewer offspring. Individuals that are better suited to their environment survive and reproduce successfully. There's fitness again, right? 
So this is important to kind of keep in mind is that those that do well pass on those traits because they have more babies. Those that don't do well don't tend to pass on those traits and therefore there are fewer of them in future generations. This again is where artificial and natural selection come into play. According to Darwin, in nature, only specific traits are passed on due to their survival of the fittest. So in nature, a trait is beneficial because it helps you to survive and is more likely to be passed on. It's not picked by anybody because they like it. It happens because it survives in nature. So the ultimate conclusion is very similar to the process of artificial selection that Darwin had studied, but instead of humans picking what's successful and therefore bred and passed on, nature decides what's going to allow the individual to survive, which determines whether they reproduce and pass that trait on. And this is why he came up with the brilliant name natural selection. Instead of artificial, where humans are doing the selecting, in this case, nature is doing the selection. In both cases, you're dealing with natural variation, what already exists, but who is making the selection is different in this case. Now we're gonna go ahead and move on to probably the most controversial part of Darwin's theory. And this is what we call descent with modification. Now, over time, natural selection results in small changes in the inherited characteristics of a population. These new changes represent a species fitness in its environment. Hopefully at this point you recognize that environments are not constant, they are changing. And because the environment is constantly changing, what species, what individual of a species is most fit also changes. So if an individual is super fit in one environment and that environment changes, they're probably no longer the most fit individual anymore. And because of this, natural selection, natural selection produces organisms that have different structures, establish different niches, or occupy different habits looking different from their ancestors. So each living species then has descended with changes from other species over time. And this is a process Darwin calls descent with modification. Now, at first glance, that may not seem very controversial, but what does this imply? And what was the big concern that so many people had with Darwin's theory? What comes up is what's called common descent. And here we get into kind of the sticky part that some people don't really like. Descent with modification suggests that all living organisms are related to one another, all of them. If you go back far enough in terms of evolution, they all share a common ancestor. And so as we go ahead and start looking at this deeper and deeper connection, we start realizing that there is common descent or a shared lineage in terms of our ancestors. You just may have to go back a long ways. All right, so those are the three major components of Darwin's theory. The struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, and descent with modification. So the other thing that I would like to do today before we kind of call it is to kind of go ahead and take a look at some evidence for evolution. Now, Darwin argued that things have been evolving on Earth for millions of years. This was based on the work of Hutton and Lyell. And he recognized evidence for his theory from several different sources. Number one, the fossil record. And we'll talk more about this later on. So we won't spend a ton of time talking about it today. Number two, the geographic distribution of living species. Where were they found? Where were they not found and why? And number three, homologous structures of living organisms. Remember that prefix homo means same. So homologous means the same structures. And lastly, number four, similarities in early development. What we're looking at here is embryology and early development prior to birth. Um, so either in the egg or inside the womb as the offspring is developing. Okay. Okay. 
So here's our evidence for evolution again. This includes the fossil record, geographic distribution of living species, homologous body structures, and similarities in early development. Okay, So the fossil record, record is looking at the physical remains of dead organisms, seeing where you can kind of watch the pieces transform over time as we go from one ancestral species to various different present day species. Number two, geographic distribution of living things. Um, when we start looking at where things live today and why they don't live other places, you can only have species that are similar to something that currently lives or used to live in a particular area. If an ancestor didn't live in a particular area, it couldn't have evolved into the species that we see today. So you only see things that were related to ancestors from a particular area. Number three, homologous body structures. Because the physical structures that make up organisms are so similar in many cases, it makes sense that they would have a shared structure in terms of their genome. So the DNA could be similar between those two different organisms. And some of that is very true when we start looking at the last one as well. Number four, similarities in early development. As we start looking at the process of the embryo developing into the new organism, the process is very similar across many, many different species. And as such suggests that there are some shared genes that would make them likely to have a shared ancestry. Let's go ahead and start with geographic distribution of species. As I mentioned, we'll go ahead and look at fossil record later on. All right. In this particular map, what you're looking at is four different species that are located across the Americas. Okay. All of them are in the rodent family, but you'll notice that only specific species live in North versus South America. Even though in some of these regions you have very similar climatic conditions, you'll notice that the beaver does not necessarily live in the same place as the koipu or the capybara. Okay? The capybara is by far the largest of these four that you see here. Um, and you'll notice that it doesn't have the same adaptations. The tails of the beaver and the capybara are different than what you would see with, say, the muskrat or the koipu. Okay? And, but you can see also two similarities in the structures of all four of these organisms. And you can see how variations might lead from one to the other. And we'll see time wise where we're at. If we can go ahead and kind of think about what kind of transitional species you would be looking for in terms of the fossil record. All right, so the next one is homologous body structures. And the big thing to look at is the bones especially in something like the arms when we go ahead and start taking a look here. Okay. Um, if we take a look, you've got one bone, two bones, many bones, digits. 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 Okay. So what we start realizing is that there's a lot of similarities between these different species, and you can find the precursors to these bones here in even a typical uh, primitive fish, like an early bony fish. One bone, two bones, many bones, digits. All right. Now let's move on to another illustration of the same basic concept. Okay. All right. So if we take a look here, this is humans, lizard, cat, whale, bat, frog, and bird. You know, some species more closely related to others. But again, here's your humerus. There's one bone, ulna, radius, two bones, carpals, many bones, and digits, one, two, three, four, five. Lizard, one, two, many, five. One, two, many, five. Even a whale, one, two, many, five. Bats, one, two, many, five, okay? Frog, one, two, many, five. Bird, one, two, many, 
Now, you don't have five here, but if you take a look at them, it could make sense that they fused. You have one, two, this could easily be two, two, three, and then four, five down here, they're fused together. If you've ever seen somebody who has syndactyly with fused digits that we talked about before, that could look very similar to what we see here. So there are a lot of similarities, and we're not all just looking at mammals, with like the human, cat, whale, but you have a lizard in here, you have a frog in here, so reptiles, amphibians, and avians, similar bone structure. Now let's take a look at early development in terms of the embryo. So if you take a look at these here, we have the lizard, tortoise, pig, and human. And when we go ahead and take a look at this, this is early, so we're looking at early development. And when you get to the last stage, yeah, they can look quite different. But when you look at these early stages, you can see the development of a tail. You've got your early arm buds, your eyeball, and the structures will actually look surprisingly similar. When you start seeing development continue onward, you see the little leg buds, arm buds, okay? Very similar. Tails are still there, although shrinking, less so here in the lizard, but the others are definitely seeing the tail shrink. And then by the time you get to the end stage, you'll notice that there are obviously differences. But the fact that they are so similar in their early development suggests some sort of genetic relationship. Okay. If we go ahead and do another drawing, this looking at even more species, you can see fish, salamander, tortoise, chicken, pig, cow, rabbit, human. Now they're lined up in terms of how closely related they are. And so if you take a look in those early stages, quite similar. When you go ahead and look at the next stage, a little later on in development, notice we can take out the fish and salamander. The tortoise, still quite similar. All right. And then when we get to these later stages, look how similar the mammals actually look. All right, so when we start looking at the mammals, definitely can separate them out from the birds or the reptiles, amphibians, and fish. So pretty spectacular. And this actually could be investigated even further by looking at something called molecular clocks, which looks at the similarities in the actual DNA structure. Um, we can talk more about this a little later on when we get into some of the evidence uh, with the fossil record. All right, so let's recap Darwin's theory and then we'll call it for today. So what is Darwin's theory? Number one, individual organisms in nature differ from one another. Some of this variation is inherited. Okay, this is what we call natural variation. Number two, organisms in nature produce more offspring than can survive. That should sound very familiar from Malthus, right? And many of those that survive do not reproduce. Number three, because more organisms are produced than can survive, members of each species must compete for limited resources. This is Darwin's struggle for existence. Again, hearkening back to the work of Malthus. And number four, because each organism is unique, each has different advantages and disadvantages in the struggle for existence. This leads directly to survival of the fittest. Individuals best suited to their environment survive and reproduce most successfully. The characteristics that make them best suited to their environment are then passed on to their offspring, and individuals whose characteristics are not well suited to the environment tend to die off or leave fewer offspring. And number six, if this is occurring in terms of the genetics that are being passed on to future generations, Species are going to change over time in response to changes in the environment. Over long periods of time, natural selection then causes changes in the characteristics of a species, such as size and form, and new species arise, causing other species to disappear. This is descent with modification, small accumulating changes over time, leading to the development of new species. All right. So, Struggle for existence, survival of the fittest, descent with modification. And thus species alive today have descended with modifications from species that lived in the past. Some of them have more 
or less in common with their ancestral species, but we can still evaluate their similarities in terms of their homologous structures, their embryology and development, their fossils, as well as their DNA in terms of molecular clocks. Thus, all organisms on Earth are united into a single tree of life by the concept of common descent. And we will refer back to this many times later on. All right, guys, that's what I've got for today. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care of yourselves. Stay healthy. Stay safe. I'll see you soon. Bye.